Hi, everyone, and welcome to the next big trade. I'm your host, Harry Malandri from MI2 Partners. Enjoy the show. Why technical analysis is important? Because it gives a clear perspective, be it for the uh, short-term trader or be it for the long-term asset allocator and fund managers about the status of the market, about the status of that stock that you're uh, looking at. This week, I'm talking to Axel Kibar. Axel's a managing director of Tech Charts Research and Trading. Axel, it's a great pleasure to meet you. How is it going? Thanks. All good. Uh, challenging markets, but so far, so good. Uh, even better for your business, I think. The more challenging they are, the better. Um, so I noticed on Twitter that it says you're in Bansko, Bulgaria. You're probably not in Bansko now, but I, I've, I've been to Bansko a couple of times. I've got a friend who's an artist who lives there. Um, I like the place. It's nice. Yeah, it's beautiful. Uh, mountains, uh, lots of nature. Yeah. Uh, outside activities, outdoor activities. Right, and I have a lot of uh, Bulgarian friends. I love Bulgarians. They're great guys. Yeah, it's a, it's a great place to hang out. It's a nice place, yes, definitely. And it helped us uh, to uh, basically escape the COVID uh, uh, lockdowns and so on. Uh, when right. You're in the nature. So you're, where are you normally based? Uh, I'm based in Bansko. Oh, you are? But, yeah, excellent. So you're yeah, a lucky man. I've, yeah, started, yeah, yeah. I've started in Bulgaria in Varna. Ah, really? Um, I, I have a lot of, I had a friend from Varna, yeah. Yeah, this is the uh, Black Sea coast uh, mm -hmm. of Bulgaria. And then uh, we moved to Bansko, uh, to the mountains. Because you could? Uh, because I could and also uh, I wanted something uh, that is more uh, remote, not a big city, a small town, um, which is usually helpful to raise kids. And, yes. Uh, yeah. That's right. I uh, I came across you on Twitter because I follow Peter Brandt, who seems to be a very big fan of yours. Um, but I noticed that your following on Twitter is enormous. How did that happen? Well, uh, over time, it's since 2011, I've been on Twitter um, and I've been sharing charts. And classical charting is a very uh, niche area in uh, technical analysis so it's like very specific uh, and uh, it's a, a pure uh, subject and Peter Brandt tweeting uh, retweeting uh, my charts definitely helped and some big followers some big uh, names as well um, tweeted and then you uh, you gain exposure to uh, to the crowd and that's how we reached uh, close to 100,000. Yeah, I uh, I noticed Hugh Hendry. I follow Hugh Hendry as well. He's always interesting. Um, it's interesting that he follows you. I, he never strikes me as a technical guy, but apparently he's more technical than I realize. But also the 13D guys uh, follow you, which I think is fascinating. 13D is a company that publishes, it's Kirill Sokolov's company, and they publish a publication called What Have I Read, uh, what I, what I Read This Week? Um, which, you know, I remember reading it. It's, it's fantastic for keeping you abreast of, you know, what's happening in markets and in the world and in macro. It's, it, it's very popular with the hedge fund community. So I thought, oh, wow, you're getting followed by 13D. You must be good. Yeah, I, I, both, both names that you mentioned, I really didn't know that they were following because I, I really lost track of uh, uh, these statistics and... Uh, uh, it's, uh, I'm trying to, uh, spend, uh, more and more time outside of the office, uh, because it's a little bit time consuming and a lot of, uh, sitting is required when I do the research. And after that, I try to, uh, get out and, uh, take care of my back, uh, because, uh, over the years I developed that, uh, major problem. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Sitting will kill you. <laughs> yeah. sitting for long periods of time will kill you and let you do it long enough. Um, so 
I, before we get started, because you've been kind enough to give us a series of charts you want to touch on. And remember, we're, we're mostly about like, you know, what is your biggest one big trade? But it's interesting we have more than one. And you, 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 you picked well, I thought. Um, why should people use technical analysis? Well, uh, it's an interesting question. Um, technical analysis, uh, when I started uh, back in 2000, basically I went through all kinds of uh, topics in technical analysis, and then I landed back on uh, classical charting, which was the starting point. Uh, I went through indicators, Elliott wave, point and figure, and when you're studying for your CMT, uh, you have to read all this material sure. and uh, be comfortable with 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 all the uh, body of knowledge. Uh, but classical charting was the point that I went back, and uh, what I've realized is that as I was talking with colleagues and uh, people who are new to the field, or even uh, fundamental uh, colleagues uh, who who uh, follow fundamental research. Uh, they thought that technical analysis was more for the short term and timing of the markets. But what I have realized is that it's more helpful uh, in the longer term, even for the asset allocators, uh, fund managers, asset managers, wealth managers. Uh, if you put out there a nice uh, long term weekly chart, you really see those uh, clean uh, support and resistance levels. You don't need much indicators. You don't need much uh, complicated uh, analysis. A, a clean chart that shows uh, the supply and demand areas is super helpful uh, for the guys who are uh, putting money to work. Uh, being able to identify uh, lengthy consolidation ranges and you realize the opportunity cost by being invested in a stock that is not moving anywhere versus a stock that is clearly in a, a steady uptrend. But just this, to be able to differentiate those stages uh, is, is huge help. And, and that's why I think technical analysis is very important. For example, colleagues used to have uh, uh, Bloomberg terminals and all of them had charts open. Uh, one square with a chart. But what does this chart actually look at? Like, What is it actually telling uh, them? They have sometimes daily charts, sometimes even intraday chart, whereas their decision making is on a quarterly basis. So by just moving it to a monthly scale or weekly scale, you're more in line with your uh, uh, investment time frame. So a lot of people uh, gave up on technical analysis because they missed this um, uh, basically um, uh, apple to apple comparison or or the time frame that they have to be on. Uh, that's why they gave up on technical analysis. So to answer your question, why technical analysis is important? Because it gives a clear perspective, be it for the uh, short term trader or be it for the long term asset allocator and fund managers about the status of the market, about the status of that stock that you're uh, looking at. Yeah, I I see. That, that strikes me as a great answer. I like that answer a lot. Um, if you had asked me the same question, because there are always people, I, I worked as a, a real money manager uh, for a number of years. And, and if you talk about technical analysis with lots of real money managers, quite a few of them will say to you, it's mumbo jumbo. They'll say it's 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 a, it's a religious item, not a. But my answer to them was always: uh, technical analysis addresses a question that nothing in that fundamental analysis does not touch, uh, which is when. And I don't care, right? If I can't explain why this works, and actually I kind of can. I can put together reasons why this should work. Because after all, you're looking at the chart summary of where people have bought and where people have sold and therefore you know where we might have an axis of people who have to react to a price move but the key point here is nothing else addresses the question of when and when matters right when matters a yes. lot um so yes. if, if if i've got nothing else i'm going to use technicals i'm going to use charts just to give my to give me a framework 
for the when decision. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there's also like one other thing, which is it's quite often I've got to cut a mistake, right? I have to, I have to, I have to admit that something is a bad trade, and I've got to cut it. Where the hell do you? What you've got to make some decision, some arbitrary decision about where to cut it. Let's make it slightly less arbitrary, <laughs> slightly less by looking at a chart. And so, but it's just, it's not, there's no alternative to making those decisions. If you're trading, you inevitably have to decide when to cut or or when to enter. And nothing else will address those questions. So that's that's kind of why I I, I think it's important. Um, So uh, you've suggested, you've got seven charts or ideas to touch on. I I love the ones you picked because like the first one, I think we'll, we'll do them in the order you sent them. Uh, the first one is ACWI, which is an ETF uh, uh, on the MSCI World Index. So it's kind of like an at world stock prices. Um, talk us through this one. Yeah, so uh, the weekly report that I publish at Tech Charts starts with three different ETFs. The review section starts with three different ETFs. And I believe that those ETFs give... Uh, a good picture of the uh, global equity markets uh, status. So one of them is the uh, iShare MSCI All Country World Index ETF, which is the developed emerging markets uh, basket. Uh, the other one is the EEM, uh, iShares MSCI Emerging Markets ETF. And the third one is iShares MSCI Frontier 100 ETF. So that gives us a, uh, the picture on the uh, frontier equities which is usually the risk, uh, risky uh, basket. So if you look at, for example, iShares MSCI All Country World Index ETF, there are a couple of points that I want to make here. Uh, in terms of simplifying technical analysis, so, so that things don't get complicated and we don't uh, end up giving up on, on this uh, tool. Uh, so there is a red line. The red line is the 200-day average. Uh, sometimes I get the question, what's the, uh, what kind of 200-day average is this? Is it the simple, exponential, weighted? Well, my answer is that it, it really doesn't matter. If you have a long-term moving average, it's better than not having any moving average or, uh, or a different period. So this is basically the long-term 200-day exponential moving average. The reason I'm using exponential is that Uh, it adapts to price changes uh, 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 much better versus the simple moving average. But even if you have a simple moving average, it will do the same job. Uh, So this is my trend filter. That means any classical chart pattern that forms above the 200-day moving average and breaks on the upside is a clear long signal. Any a chart pattern that completes below the 200-day moving average, and it's a bullish signal, it's a red flag for me. It's still a red light. I want to be trading in the direction of the overall trend. Likewise, if we have a major breakdown that's taking place below the long-term average, that's a clear short signal. Now, there are two uh, good signals that can be visit, that can be seen on this chart. One of them is the rectangle breakout that was above the 84.15 levels back in September-October period 2020. So that took place above the 200-day average. And then the next one was a symmetrical triangle that broke out above the 95.9 levels. Again, it was in an uptrend and that basically an, uh, uh, confirmed the uptrend, even though it was choppy afterwards, still it inched higher, the index inched higher. Now, we've seen a reversal and the price fell below the 200-day average in the beginning of 2022. And since then, we have been trading below the uh, 200-day average, and this is uh, considered to be a corrective uh, market phase. Recently, from 81.4, we have seen a rebound. And that, I analyzed it as a short-term double bottom. Now, when I say short-term double bottom, 
it's a reversal, but it is still very uh, minor because we're still below the 200 day average. This can be considered uh, a long signal for short term traders, which to capture the last couple of days uh, swing, uh, swing uh, on the upside. Uh, but from a longer term perspective, I still want to see the index moving back above the uh, 200 day average to get really excited about the global equities. So far, when we broke about 87, the price target was 92.7 levels for that, for that short term double bottom. And today we are reaching that level. And interestingly enough, we are also testing the 200 day moving average. So we are clearly at a important resistance level right now. Now, what could be an interesting setup if we start pulling back and form maybe the right shoulder of a possible head and shoulder bottom there? Uh, I'm not sure if it is clearly uh, visible for, for the audience, but the left shoulder would be basically the 85.4 level and then the head would be 81.4 and then we start pulling back towards 87 to form the right shoulder of a head and shoulder bottom. Now that breakout, if we can complete that and clear on the upside, would clear the 200 day average, would be a clear uh, long signal in that case for the longer term uh, investors. For now, what I can say is that the double bottom price target is being met with today's move and we are now testing the 200 day average. So it's a critical uh, inflection point that we're testing uh, on the global equities. I love inflection points. I think all traders love inflection points, right? That's that's what we live for. Because uh, you, if you, this is a, a pivot from what what could be a breakout to a bull market or a continuation of a bear market. And uh, I really don't know what we're going to do. My my, if I were to guess, I'd guess we're going to still be in a bear market. But you know, it wouldn't be the first time I've been totally wrong. And um, if if it's not for the charts, I've got no way of assessing where we're going. So um, uh, and you're a technician, so you haven't got any guess as to where this is going to go. What you think is going to happen? Well, I think I would bet on the. Uh uh, trading range between 92.7 and 87 in the next uh, couple of weeks to months. So maybe a little bit of easing of this uh, move uh, and consolidating uh, between those two levels. That would actually give me a nice uh, setup, as I said, maybe a formation of a head and shoulder. Uh, a higher low would be really constructive here. So the low is 81.4 and we form a higher low that doesn't go below 87. That would be really constructive uh, for global equities, uh, closer to possibly the end of year. Uh, that would be positive. It's very interesting, worth keeping an eye. So, and your next chart is uh, EEM. Now I'm very familiar with EEM. It's an emerging market equity ETF. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of guys who trade are familiar with it because it's a nice shorthand thing. I, I know it's an EM equity index, which has a fair dose of China in it. So talk us through this one. So on this one, uh, for example, we looked at the All Country World Index ETF and there was this double bottom, short term double bottom. And that is a, is a horizontal setup. Uh, when I... I started uh, publishing the uh, Global Equity Markets Report uh, back in 2016. Um, I made sure that the reports focus on horizontal setups to make it easier for the audience to be able to identify those, those patterns. Diagonal patterns are more difficult. Trend lines are easy to draw, very reliable. Uh, so for example, here, for those who like to trade, it, there's a falling wedge. Uh, it's a wedge pattern, but I'm not sure if this is really a wedge pattern because it has a, 
higher possibility to morph into something else, given its diagonal uh, shape. But this is to, to stress the importance of not depending on diagonal patterns. I put out this emerging markets ETF chart. Uh, if one uh, would like to trade those two ETFs, all country world index ETF was, was a better uh, uh, opportunity out there versus the EM. But uh, from a technical uh, point of view, if you look at this pattern, you can see the downward momentum is decreasing. So ideally, this downtrend would form a downward channel, but you can see the lows not reaching to the lower boundary of the, uh, the pattern, and there is this uh, rebound taking place. But you can see we're still far from the 200-day moving average. So 44.2 versus all country world index ETF is, is touching the 200-day average, and EEM is uh, clearly weaker. Uh, than the uh, all country world index ETF. So uh, emerging markets still have uh, headwinds. I think due to a uh, strong US dollar, still that team is there, which is our, I think, next chart. To totally agree. Totally agree. So you're going to look at the Dixie next, I think. Yeah, DXY. Similar to all country world index ETF. Now, this is also a monthly scale price chart. Now, the beauty of long-term charts is that you can see uh, the technical levels clearly. And uh, when you go up the uh, time frames, weekly and monthly, the interesting thing is uh, there are those uh, Bibles of classical charting, Richard Schabacher's book, Edwards and McGee's book on classical charting principles. Yeah. And when you go to 1930s, 1940s charts, the daily scale price charts are very similar to weekly and monthly scale uh, price charts of today. Yes, the daily charts have become volatile uh, and due to market participation and so on, but still the weekly and monthlies give that clear picture uh, if you're looking at the longer term uh, price charts. So, for example, the US dollar index has one of those clean uh, consolidation. Um, at the time of 2020-2021 bottom, I started becoming bullish on the US dollar index and there was so much money printing going on and the comments that I was getting on Twitter was uh, that the uh, US dollar is, is dead and it's uh, toilet paper and so on. So if you're a contrarian investor, uh, those comments were really interesting uh, as we were testing the uh, bottom uh, and then we completed that double bottom and then that rally started all the way to 103. Around 103, I started thinking that, okay, you know, we will find resistance here and we can consolidate a little bit more, but we broke above that. And then I went back and said, hey, guys, we, we broke out 103. This is a breakout confirmation. And now previous resistance becomes the new support. So now 103 is the support. And this trend is still uh, strong, in my opinion. Uh, if we think that this is a rectangle that started, uh, that goes back to 2016, the price target is at 117. Uh, and uh, it can still continue up uh, uh, with different uh, consolidations and, and trend periods. Uh, but any, any move below 103 uh, would put uh, the bullish uh, interpretation in question. So stops being slightly below 103, uh, price target is uh, 170. 117 is a slightly terrifying so for those of us who actually invest in emerging markets and yeah i do um and i invest in things like argentinian distressed debt invest may be the wrong word for that um and the idea of the dollar index at 117 it's in an inevitably bearish thing it would imply even more stress in emerging markets and i'm i'm getting anecdotes from 
contacts and you know people I speak to on markets, um, anecdotes out of Asia saying they're already seeing a lot of distress uh, in making dollar payments. Dollars are getting scarce in the emerging markets already. Um, the kind of situation where we that pressure increases is one that can't be bullish for those markets. Mm-hmm. So for what little that's worth. Yeah. Uh, what's the, the next thing you'd like to look at? Is, is it going to be crude? Yeah. So we're looking at crude oil. And this is interesting. Uh, now, questions come and it's about correlation. So if the US dollar is going up, what would the crude oil do or what would the bonds do and so on? Uh, I usually answer it in a way that uh, each chart is different and I like to treat each chart on its own merit. Uh, So uh, sometimes correlations can break down uh, and dollar can remain strong and crude oil can rebound as well. Uh, that doesn't mean that strong dollar would mean weak commodities. Uh, teams change uh, and correlations can break down. So when we're looking at the crude oil chart, and given that previous chart was US dollar index, let's not try to uh, uh, make a correlation between those two, but look at the uh, internal dynamics, what the chart is uh, trying to tell us here. So the chart has a has a clear range between 94 and 126 and we reversed from 126 we came back and tested the july during july the 200 day moving average and the lower boundary at 94 so over the past couple of days we've seen a breakdown and now we are rebounding back to 94 so it's really interesting and important to see how the price is going to react around this level. If it stalls around 94 and starts going down, we can we can confirm that we completed a four month long rectangle with a price target of 17, 71. 17. You had you had me very nervous there. I was thinking, oh my god. <laughs> 71. Yeah. So. Uh, but the the flip side is that this can become a failed breakdown if we move back above 94 and the 200 day average. So next couple of days is going to be interesting for crude oil. Yeah, I'm, this is one. I'm so my fundamental analysis would say to me that it just can't break down that much, but I'm aware that I make a lot of mistakes and I get things wrong a lot. And the best way of judging these things is price action. So it's very useful for me to see this. So you've told me basically I should pivot my view around 94. Yeah, 94, 94. And if we can't hold above 94, yeah. um, then this thing is going down. And if it can, if I, otherwise I should be buying, buying above 94 with a stop slightly below. And we'll see in the next few exactly. days. Very useful. Very useful. Okay, what's the next one? So the next charts are equities. Um, I love rectangles. So uh, rectangles are easier to identify on price charts. And uh, the reason for that is that we have clean horizontal boundaries. And for me, uh, to be able to identify a rectangle or any horizontal pattern, Uh, I need to see minimum three touch points on a horizontal line. So the third, after the third test, if the fourth one is a breakout, it's a perfect setup. And you can see that this stock, uh, it's a solar company uh, listed on Spanish exchange, uh, has a four month long rectangle that has uh, perfect uh, boundaries. The upper boundary is at 23.4, the lower boundary is 19.4, and it also ticks the box that this consolidation is taking place above the 200-day average. So any breakout on the upside would be a clean uh, long signal for me. The price target is around 27.2. The reason I brought this pattern 
is that I wanted to uh, highlight the importance of rectangle patterns and how uh, clean they look on price charts if you if you catch one uh, and usually breakouts from those uh, are reliable so I was going to ask you a question on this. So my question was, which chart pattern is your go-to pattern? And is it fair to say that rectangles are your, your go-to? This is the one you want to rely on. This is where you where you make your bread and butter, where, the, where this is what you like and you feel comfortable. Yeah, I like the rectangles. Over the past five years, I've collected some statistics on different chart patterns. Uh, most of them horizontal patterns with one exception on symmetrical triangle and the best performing patterns around 60-65% uh, success rate has been the head and shoulder head and shoulder top, head and shoulder bottom hmm. and then comes the uh, rectangle but the difference is that because you see head and shoulder top and head and shoulder bottom at market turning points and you don't have those type of uh, cycles frequently because after an extended trend you see head and shoulder tops right. and head and shoulder bottoms the the frequency the winner is rectangle because rectangles can be uh, spotted on a down trend on an up trend in the middle of a trend uh, so that for that reason I like the rectangle because it gives you the comfort also, also on uh, uh, number of trades number of ideas yeah they're not it's not seasonal you don't have to wait for a turning point in a broader economic cycle or something like yeah. i like that i like that a lot um so my the, the 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 i'm not a good technician that's that's why i actually pay peter brandt because he's a much better technician than me and uh there's no point in me even studying I, i'm never going to catch up now it's much better but if if there was a pattern i like because you know you have good experiences it's cup and handles I've always had very good experiences with cup and handle patterns. Um, uh, what do you think of cup and handles generally? Cup and handle is a bullish uh, chart pattern. I look at it as a, a continuation pattern. Uh, sometimes it is confused as a reversal, but it doesn't form at market bottoms. It's as a continuation. After an uptrend, it forms as a continuation pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like... Uh, it's like a derivative of an ascending triangle. It's more like an ascending triangle in a rush. So it lacks one, one swing uh, that ascending triangle has. So that's why cockpit handle can be more bullish than ascending triangle because the market is in a rush. So it forms the cup and then the handle and then the breakout takes place. Uh, there has been several discussions on this pattern as uh, um, different names given, volatility contraction pattern uh, by different authors and traders. Mm. So it serves the same purpose, uh, a horizontal pattern that acts like continuation uh, and it provides a level for entry uh, in long trades. Okay, what's what's your what's the next one? The next one again, there are two rectangle patterns. These were the um, um, the stocks that we all followed uh, during the COVID uh, um, pandemics. Um, one of mm. them is the uh, Biontech, the chart on the left hand side. The other one is Moderna on the right hand side. So. Uh, if we look at the chart on the right hand side, I want to highlight the importance of uh, a team, uh, the 200 day moving average. When you plot it on a weekly scale, it becomes the 40 week moving average. So you can see that ascending triangle in 2021. It was a horizontal pattern that completed on the upside and we were above the 200 day average. We're looking at Moderna chart on the right hand side. Now, what happened since then is that market reversed, we fell below the 200 day, and now we are in a rectangle pattern and testing the 200 day average. So I would say we are at an inflection point here. The rectangle breaks on the upside. We also clear the 200 day average. This puts us, puts us back into bullish territory with a price target of 247.3. If we fail here, we're still in a range. 
the trading range becomes 184 and 221. So it's really critical what this stock is going to do in the next couple of weeks. Do we clear that boundary and move into bullish territory or we fail here and then uh, we test the lows again? The chart on the left is very similar. Uh, it's again the 200 day moving average is being tested with a clean rectangle pattern. So I put two targets here. If we break it on the downside, we're talking about 88.5. If we break it on the upside, we're talking about 238 levels for Biontech. And these two are clean rectangle patterns that is uh, offering actionable uh, trade signals. You know, I'm so done with COVID. I hope this breaks to the downside. We all hope, yes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I know that interest rates was not something you prepared as a chart, but I, you know, I spend a lot of my time thinking about rates. What are you thinking right now? Is there anything interesting going on in rates? And I should say dollar rates, right? Yeah. So uh, on the yields, I look at the 10-year uh, yield index. The, uh, the chart that I follow is TNX. Um, on the TNX, what we have seen is was a steady uptrend, and we have been clearly above the 200-day uh, average. So the, the move started actually much earlier, uh, the confirmation signal of, uh, of a breakout came much earlier, and I have covered this as well. So it was one of the patterns that you like, the cup with handle uh, that completed mm -hmm. on the upside. Back in, uh, let me see, January uh, 2022. Ah, it was a beautiful yeah. trade. It was just so little downside. Yeah, with a breakout about 1.7, it was followed by a pullback and then continuation. So You know, this is a trade that proves I'm an idiot because I saw the cup and handle. I saw the breakout. I saw there was no downside and I had a position. But of course, the real point is, why didn't I remortgage my house to do this trade? Because it was just perfect, um, and I, you know, this is—I don't understand. Is it? This is a weak, my weakness as a trader. You got to bet big when you have a beautiful, perfect setup. Yes, I agree with you. Maybe not not big, but at least to act one way or another. Uh, meaningfully, yeah, meaningfully, meaningfully, it should it should make yeah, a difference. Yeah. So that pullback was followed by a continuation. Now, what we are seeing is that. Uh, Again, I'm going to uh, stress the importance of the long-term average because if, if we look at that uh, small head and shoulder pattern that's forming on the daily, uh, the left shoulder being in May and the head uh, reached to 3.4, 3.5 levels in June and then followed by the right shoulder in July was completed on the downside, but we were above the 200-day average. So I mentioned that there is a higher chance we fail because you're in an uptrend and, um, and bearish chart patterns in an uptrend are likely to fail more often uh, than uh, bearish chart patterns in a downtrend. So right now we are seeing that renewed strength above 2.7 neckline. And that clearly shows that this was a failed breakdown and the yields are still uh, strong. So we still have mm -hmm. uh, the momentum going on on the yields. Okay, so not yet. We, it's too soon to think that this is over. No, I don't think so. That's, inter that's really interesting. Yeah. Very interesting. So, you know, I'm really intrigued that there are so many uh pivot points or you know uh, critical places where we have yet to see and it's august in the markets and we're having a rally in the middle of a bear market all of this kind of builds to a crescendo we'll see right me personally i think we have more bear market to come but hey i'm wrong a lot <laughs> okay I, one thing that markets have taught me is that i'm wrong a lot Axel. 
Um, if people want to get more of your work or become more familiar with what you do, because we're kind of out of time here, um, uh, where can they find you? Well, my uh, website is www.techcharts.net uh, and my Twitter handle is TechCharts. So I'm really active on both platforms and uh, I'll be happy to connect with uh, with followers and uh, if, you, if anyone has uh, questions, uh, I'll be happy to answer all those on be it social media or via email uh, through, through the website as well. Thank you so much for coming on. I, uh, I really enjoyed that. That was very useful for me. I hope it was useful for other people. Um, let's do it again sometime. Sure. Thanks for having me. All right. That's a wrap on the next big trade. Be sure to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And as always, head over to realvision.com for financial insight you won't find anywhere else. Hey, everyone. If you like this podcast, you should check out the full finance journey at realvision.com forward slash RV pod to get the full view of what Real Vision is all about. A video on demand platform you can watch anywhere. Our members get daily videos and analysis plus access to more than 3,000 videos for beginners and experienced investors alike, and live events online. To get started, visit realvision.com forward slash rvpod and use the promo code PODCAST10 to get 10% off our essential membership for the first year.